Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Tam Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen practices family medicine with the Washington Township Medical Foundation. So what are we talking about today, which is screening and prevention? So what is the importance of screening? Well, clinical prevention services, like screening for diseases, really help, including immunization, will really help reduce the amount of problems, death that occurs in our nation as well as for each individual patient. Despite the fact that it is, is covered by insurance because of the ACA law, many people, adults and kids, do not actually utilize these services. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Many of the stuff you probably have, others you may not. So we want to give you this talk so that you can discuss openly with your doctor. Many of the strongest indicators for health, besides the, the stuff that you know about, the disease, the healthy eating, which is also the screening. So uh, offers tremendous opportunity to save lives, both in, in years as well as quality of life. It's both science-based as well as evidence-based. So a lot of times, many physicians would do a lot of stuff what they feel to be correct and not really evidence-based. So what the talk will be about today is really test that is, that is uh, backed up by the government and research and, and, and stuff that's, the, that's why it's covered. So the test is not necessarily unnecessary and it will be a cost to you or to the healthcare system. So the stuff that we would be talking about will be cancer prevention, some chronic diseases, and of course infectious diseases, uh, stuff that what's going on for um, hepatitis and other area. So give me an example. In the 1900s, the biggest three cause of death in the US was pneumonia, which is infection of the lung, tuberculosis, and diarrhea. Within 100 years, we pretty much eliminated that, it shifted all that down and so now it's really about cancer and heart disease. So stuff that we can really impact on, on society, including immunization. So just a quick idea of what to expect. Here's a plot of mortality. As you can see, life quality improved at this drop, so people are dying less. The rate is decreasing. So for example, the Department of U.S. Health was, was formed back in the early 1900. After that, chlorine was added to the water. As you can see, this drop. It's a phenomenon. We had the flu uh, pandemic of the 1917, uh, 19, you've heard 1917 uh, influenza. So that caused a spike. Other than that, we discovered that a lot of the diseases, infectious diseases caused by human contact and hand washing was implemented and the rate dropped. First antibiotic was introduced, penicillin, in the 1940s. It dropped again. The first vaccine was introduced. The, the rate dropped, and then it was the passage of the Vaccine Assistance Act, which means that even if you can't afford it in the U.S., vaccines were able to be given to you. And as you can see, if these kind of preventative measures really does save lives. There are many aspects to having good health. There is the physical environment, your surrounding. In you know, a very third world country, when there's dirty, that affects it. Your social, what you can afford, the impact around you, Individual behavior, what you do and don't do. Of course, genetics, biology, your genes, what, you, what your parents give to you. All, and of course, health services is what we provide for you in the screening services, all contribute to health outcomes. Today, we'll be mostly focusing on health services. So how can your doctor help you? Well, I have a solution to all of your health problems. Pretty much change everything about your life. Of course, sometimes that's possible, other times it's not. So we'll be talking about the stuff that's possible. There are many guidelines. ACP, US, so what are guidelines? So the guidelines are basically a bunch of doctors in, in a certain specialty giving recommendations for the nations and around the world. The American College of Physicians, the US Preventive Task Force, CTP, CI, so for example, AMA's American Association, ACC's American College of Cardiology, AHA, American Heart Association, American Urology, inter the International 
Institute of Medicine. So there are different organizations, and so therefore, sometimes if you, as you talk to multiple doctors, they will give you many different opinions. So which one do you listen to? So therefore, one of the best organizations is the U.S., United States Preventive Service Task Force. So unlike the other organization that only is specialty specific, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force compri comprise of various specialties. So different doctors of different fields come together and give the recommendation. If the U.S., the United States, this organization that's sponsored by the government, recommends something, the insurance more often than not are obliged to pay for it. Not so by the other organization. So hope, and therefore, the recommendation that I'm going to give is mostly, or if not all, from the U.S. PSTF. Questions? Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is cervical cancer. So this is mostly for women. The cervix is a female organ that's in the vagina, and this occurs because of intercourse. And so therefore, we need to screen them so to prevent them from getting cancer of the cervix. So sexually active adolescents generally are the higher risk. For a virus, it's called HPV, the human papilloma virus. We know that it was one of the few cancer that is caused by infection. And this is, occurs, because of, of course, with sex. And therefore, we do a pap smear. Most of these abnormalities are transient. That means it does go away. Just because you get, you get the flu doesn't mean you actually get sick. So same thing with this particular virus. Therefore, the U.S. Preventive Task Force says that women don't need to have a, uh, a pap smear until the 21. After 21, it goes all the way up to 65. At 65, we generally stop the, rec uh, the screening every three years. In the past, it used to be every year. Now that we have a vaccine for HPV and know, understand that a little bit more, we're able to reduce that down to every three years. And if a woman's above 30, between 30 and 65, and they do a, a pap smear with the, the, the HPV testing, it can be done every five years, as long as the partner's the same and there's no symptoms. Once again, screening is for those who are without symptoms. Women under 21, regardless of the sexual history, regardless of what's going on, we do not do a pap smear. That's been forced by several organizations, including ACOC, which is the American College of Obstetric and Gynecology. The U.S. Preventive Task Force do not recommend, they say, not only should we not do it, it actually cause, can cause harm after 65, because the chance of cervical cancer and dying from cervical cancer is very, very low to almost non-existent, so we don't need to screen, so you don't need to have a pap smear anymore after 65. It's a general rule if they have normal pap smear in the past. So in the past 10 years, they've had a couple of pap smear that is normal. So that's the reason why we, we, we can stop. You also don't need to have a pap smear again so, uh, if you had a hysterectomy for non-cancer related reason, fibroid, bleeding. Sometimes you just uh, don't want to have kids anymore, but that's unusual, it's an it's a aggressive way. If you, have, if you had the hysterectomy, which means the removal of the, the, the cervix with the, with the uterus, then you don't have to have a pap smear. Many times hysterectomy is done because of pre-cancer or cancer, if that's the case, then a pap smear need to be continued. Well, even though there's no cervix, we actually swap the vagina inside, the, inside. So that's cervical cancer. In addition to screening, we actually now have HPV. We understand that HPV is the cause. Not only, there are literally hundreds of types of species of HPV. We have narrowed it down to two, if not four different types. So we focus on that, 16 and 18. And so the test, test for this, and if it's not there, then the next time that, you, that a woman need, really need to do is roughly five years. In addition, all of our female, as well as male now, can actually get the vaccines to prevent getting HPV. When it first introduced several years ago, HPV was only for female. And now that we know that a man can also get penile cancer as well as genital warts from this virus, we actually vaccinate boys as well. Not only will it prevent them from getting the genital warts and cancer, it also helps prevent the transmission when these young men become men and they have a relationship with their female counterparts. So that's the reason why HPV vaccine is available. You can vaccinate as young as nine, but we generally start at 11 and go all the way up to 26 for, for vaccine. And insurance does cover of all this.
Okay? So then we'll stay with the female and go to the breast cancer. Breast can uh, cancer screening is very known, it's easy to do, but the controversy lies in what age it should, be, it should start. So the benefit and harm of breast cancer screening really varies by age. So if we need to, why don't we start breast screening when a woman goes into adolescence, when she develops first breast? Well, the chance of that is very low, and the detection of a breast cancer in a very young is much more difficult because the breast is more dense. So therefore, we have to go through and risk stratify and see what's the likelihood of someone getting breast cancer. And so the younger the woman, it is less, the, the mammography, which is a test for breast cancer, is less accurate. We know that anyone under 40 is much more difficult. So there are, therefore, there's a lot of false positive, which means the mammography is done and they see some kind of lesion and they end up not being cancer. So for the most part, across the country and across the world, it's not recommended to do any mammography unless there's a cyst or a lump. Then that's no longer screening. It's actually testing for a condition. No one under 40 years of, years, years of age should be tested. Now, between 40 and 50, now that's where the controversy stands. Above 50, every organization around the country and around the world recommends it should be done. It's between 40 and 50. Several organizations recommend at 40, others recommend at 50. Because of the controversy, if you've been around, you hear that when that recommendation by the U.S. Preventive Task Force came out, a lot of congressmen and all those people said, no, no, that's not the case. And so therefore, the insurance kept it at 40, so they will pay at 40, but the recommendation is not really until 50. More of the organization, even those listed, as in the past year, when I, when I gave this talk, says 40. For example, ACS, American Cancer Society, have actually changed it to 45. ACOG is one of the few, American College of Obstetric, has said 40, but then they're actually leaning towards 45 now. Around the world, it's actually recommended at 50. Okay, so that's for breast cancer screening. Even though the insurance recommends um, stopping, at 70, uh, stopping at 75, several group is not clear, but U.S. Preventive Task Force says that after 75, breast, ca breast cancer screening with mammography is really not needed or it's, it, it's too hard to tell. Unless a woman is very vibrant, they look like they have another 20 years left at 75, then you can consider doing additional mammography. Now, even though we do the breast mammography every year, the recommendation is every two years. But insurance will pay for it because it's such a controversy and such emotion that comes with it. So just kind of keep in mind for mammography. Like I said, most North American groups tend to shift towards annual, even though it's recommended every two years. Okay? And that is uh, breast cancer screening. So let's talk about the, the self, the, the, I'm sorry, the breast exam by a doctor. If you were older, when you went to the doctor, for your annual, the, the doctor will examine your breast as part of the exam. It's actually really not really recommended anymore. The reason is that the doctor's exam is not as accurate. So when a doctor feels something, they order a bunch of tests and find out that that's, that's benign cyst. So therefore, even though the Cancer Society recommends it, they actually are weakening this stand, and the U.S. Preventive Force said there's no benefit to really to do a clinical breast exam, a breast exam by the doctor. So many physicians are not doing, self, doing the breast exam. And then the WHO, the World Health Organization, actually says it's not only not beneficial, it actually can cause harm. So what does harm mean? getting all these biopsy, getting potentially worrying the woman they can't sleep for something that may not be any, any problem at all. How about the self-breast exam? If you were younger, you're, you're told, oh, do your self-exam every day or every week or in the shower. So what does the data shows on that? So therefore, the data shows that there is no real benefit because sometimes a woman can feel it and it's hard to tell. As a general rule, it's, even though it's not recommended to self-breast exam, a woman should still do it. If they sense anything, then talk to the doctor. So that's self-breast exam. Okay, so that's the breasts. Now we'll leave that for female. Now let's go into the colon, which is male and female. The colon is our gut, and of course colon cancer can occur, especially in the Western world, more so than the Eastern world. Like for example, many Asians who move to the U.S. are actually have an increased rate of, of colon cancer screening. It's believed that it's probably from the diet, possibly from the environment, but so therefore we need to do colon cancer screening. There are different tests. 
There are the stool test and then the imaging test, and I'll go through each one of this. So in terms of the imaging, these are what's available and recommended. So there is flexible sigmoidoscopy. In this area, we don't talk about sigmoidoscopy as much because colonoscopy is very available. There's a lot of specialty. But in certain areas of the country where, where GI doctor and family physician who, do, who don't do colonoscopy much, then the, the, the next best option is sigmoidoscopy. There's also double contrast barium enema, DCBA. That's some, some, pretty much an x-ray. That's not used as much because of other stuff. These are the two newer recommendations. It's called the CT or the virtual colonoscopy, which means nothing sticks. Stick, both the sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy is pretty much a long tube, 70 inches or so, of, that stick up the butt and goes all the way to figure out the colon. So many patients don't like that. So therefore, CT, virtual CT, which means it's a CAT scan, and they measure and they look at that. And then the capsule, pretty much, you take a, a little pill that's video, you swallow it, and it shows images as, as it goes through the gut. In, for example, Israel, they use this a lot. In the U.S., we don't use this as much. We mostly focus on the top two. Even though around this area, meaning the, the, the Bay Area, colonoscopy is prominent, there's actually very little data that, that is superior over the other modality, which is a stool test as well as sigmoidoscopy. So therefore, uh, you should talk to your doctor. What is the best cost, effectiveness, and personal preference? And of course, what's available in order to do your colon cancer screening? So for example, if a patient's really fearful of doing something up their butt, then I don't always force that. There's other modalities that we can use. Now, if they don't mind, then we should do that because it, it's a good test. So once again, there's no single test that is superior over the other. Even though many doctors will advocate for colonoscopy, the data is very weak. Actually, the, the best data is sigmoidoscopy. But so, anyway, you only have to worry about that. The point of this is that talk to your doctor and find what's the best test for you in terms of will you do it if it's so invasive? You may not want to. Not only get something to stick up your butt, and you, you have to drink this awful drink and poop and clear your gut for one to two days before the test. So a lot of patients don't like that. So when should you start? Luckily, unlike breast, there is not much controversy. On average, 50 is the average age for, every, for everyone, unless there's a colon cancer history in the family. And generally, you start 10 years before the, the, di the age when they were diagnosed. So if you have a brother, sister, cousin who has colon cancer at, for example, 45, then the colonoscopy should be started at 35 for you. Otherwise, age 50. Now, some organization, like the American, uh, like the gastro, gastroenterology, recommends African American to get at age 45 because they're at higher risk. But on average, it's age 50. So, when should you discontinue uh, colon cancer? It's done every 10 years, as long as there's nothing going on. Now, if there's polyps, if there's ab abnormality, then the screening time will be shortened. But shy of that, is done every 10 years. And then you generally stop at age 75 or, or, the, or the time where you feel that you have another 10 years left in your life. So if you're an 85-year-old, very vibrant and active, then you can still do a colonoscopy. So how often should it be done? The stool test, is, which is a little card you, you send home and you, you, you spread the poop on it, very simple, very easy, but the only problem is it should be done every year. This so is called the fecal occult blood test. Sigmoidoscopy is a test that I mentioned it only goes halfway instead of colonoscopy, which goes the full way, is every five years. Colonoscopy, once again, is every 10 years if everything is normal. The CT, the, uh, the CT colonoscopy is every five. The double berry enema is five. But once again, these two tests are not done much in this area, or especially in the U.S. Okay, so that's colon cancer. So let's talk about prostate. Now we talk about the woman, let's talk about the men. Obviously, prostate is only in men. Prostate is like the breast. It's very, very controversial of whether it should be screened at all. So before I talk about screening, let's talk about the number. There's no one good test for prostate. One of the most closest we have is a blood test that's called PSA, called the Prostate Surface Antigen Test. That test is generally given above 50, 45 to 50, depending on the recommendation and organization. As long as the value is below four, the chance of prostate cancer is low. The chances doesn't mean it's zero. 
And then if it's above four, then there's an increased chance of 30% that, that the prostate can have cancer. So just because the PSA is abnormal or high above four, doesn't mean you have prostate cancer. However, just because it's low, it doesn't mean that you don't have it. So, the, so what happens is that the reason why it's so controversial and through the decades, the recommendations change back and forth whether it should be screened because screening to get a biopsy of the prostate is not easy. You have to go up the butt. It can cause bleeding. It can cause in impotence. It can cause a urinary problem. So that's what, the reason why it's such a controversy and it's not an easy test. And in addition to that, prostate cancer is one of the slowest growing cancer around. Many men, they've done autopsy study, which means men who have died for other natural causes, they found a good percent of them had prostate cancer without knowing it. So the question is, even if you detect the cancer, would you even bother treating it? So that's where the controversy lies. So it's something that each man should have a discussion with their doctor, knowing who they are, are they the worrier, or if they don't care, if they want more quality versus quantity of their life, then the prostate cancer may or may not be warranted. So BS, PSA base screening results is, is small and there's no reduction in prostate cancer, but it can cause a lot of unnecessary treatment and evaluation, which is, can be stressful for the patient and can cause potential harm. For example, if they have no prostate cancer, now they have, they're impotent. Or if they have no prostate cancer and now they have problem with, with, with defecation or stooling. Okay. So the other reason why this test is not great, it's just because this, t this test is, is elevated. There's many reasons why a large prostate, a normal large prostate can raise that. An infection called acute prostatitis, subclinical inflammation. So for example, why is inflamed? A biker who sits on their butt all the time, like a cross country biker, they can have elevation of the PSA. An exam by a finger by a doctor can elevate that. Any biopsy, any kind of, any kind of procedure, any kind of ejaculation can cause elevation. So many normal things can cause this to be elevated. Now you have to go through and worry the patient, potential biopsy and other stuff. So that's why this test is very controversial. So it's not right for every man. So you have to have the discussion with, the, with your doctor. So therefore men to make informed decision with their doctor about whether or not this test is appropriate. Starting at between age 15 to 55, depending on the different organization. For the most part, the new recommendation that just, just came out a few months ago is at 55 by the U.S. Preventive Task Force. Okay, so that's the prostate. So the next thing, one of the newer screening cancer, when I say new, I mean within two or three years. In the past, there was no screening for lung cancer because there, we didn't find anything. Chest x-ray was not appropriate and CT was too expensive. But nowadays, we actually can screen for lung cancer, and it is recommended. And many physicians forget about this screening. So who should be screened? Not everybody, obviously, because the biggest risk for lung cancer is smoking. So therefore, CT scanning is, is recommended for the following. If you are 55 years and older, male or female, and that you have a history of smoking, 30-pack year history, what does 30-pack year means? It means that you have smoked for 30 years, one pack a day. So if you smoke two pack a day, then it's only 15 years. And if you smoke half a pack a day, then it's for 60 years. Does that make sense? In short, just you can discuss it with your doctor or you've quit within only 15 years. And in your 55s, you should have this done every year with a CT scan. It's called a low dose CT scan. So that's lung cancer. It's one of the newer recommendations by the U.S. Preventive Task Force, by American College of Cancers, American mm -hmm. Cancer Society, and the Amer American College of Physicians. So many organizations do recommend this. So it's, but it's only for smoker, either recently quit within 15 years or current smoker who has an sm intensive amount of smoking. Okay, skin cancer. So many times you hear our colleagues at dermatology say, oh, you should have a full body scan. Unfortunately, there's no data insufficient data supporting a body scan for skin cancer. Now, if you have a mole or a lesion or any kind of skin problem that you're suspicious, then by all means have a check. When it says screening, meaning you have, if you're fine, you don't have anything, you just, want, you just want to get naked and have a doctor look at your skin. There's no recommendation for that that says that it does anything. Okay, so that's skin, can, skin cancer screening. Okay, so let's talk about shots, immunization to stay healthy. 
flu shot is obvious. In the past, we used to say only high-risk people should get the flu shot. Now, everyone six months, years or older should get the flu shot. So starting six months to death, you should get the flu shot. In the past, there were people who would say, I have egg allergies and I should not get the flu shot. So now, most of the flu shot don't have the egg ingredient, and if they do, it's so minuscule that even if you have an egg allergy, you can get the flu shot, especially the inactive one, not the, uh, the, uh, not the live virus, which is the nasal spray, which in the past two years have not been recommended. So I don't know about this coming up year. So that's the flu. Simple, everybody should get that once a year because the strand changes. Something that's often overlooked is a pneumonia shot. Now, pneumonia is not for everybody like the flu. It's only for certain condition. So who should get the pneumonia shot? Every adult 65 years or older should get the pneumonia shot. So if you're 65, male or female, you should get the pneumonia shot. Now, there are different types of pneumonia shot. There are the 23 and then there's the 13. You should get both, 65 years and a year apart. Now, as kid, we, uh, as kid, they get the 13. So they, they get the 13. There used to be what we call a 7, pneumonia 7, Prevnar 7, or PCV 7. That's no longer available because it's, it's surpassed, now replaced by the 13. So all kids in, in the U.S. gets 13, and all adults 65 years and older should get a 13, followed by a 23, which is over here a year later. Those two will provide good protection from getting pneumonia, which is infection of the lung. In addition to those population, the very young, so under five should get, should get pneumonia, and 65, if you have the following. If you smoke, you should get pneumonia. If you have any heart disease, not just not hypertension, but congestive heart failure or heart failure, you should get pneumonia. If you have asthma or COPD, which is a form of smoking, emphysema, or if you have a liver problem, if you have any kind of kidney disease, and of course diabetes, you should get pneumonia vaccine, vaccines. So many of our diabetics are not getting pneumonia shots, so they should get a pneumonia shot, which is a 23 and not the 13. And of course, any other these condition, including smoking. Many times, the patients are either not getting it or they're getting it too often, so you don't need that. If you get it for the right conditions, then your insurance will cover for that. And of course, forgot alcohol abuse. So not just regular use, but drinking excessively will also get that. Alcohol abuse will lead to liver cirrhosis. So that's one of the reasons why. Okay, so that's the pneumonia shot. Shingo shot. Shingo is basically a reactivation of the chicken pox. So if you had a chicken pox when you, when you were younger, then there's a good chance you may get shingles. So therefore, it's recommended now. If you, does anyone have, I won't have ever had shingles? Or sh it's not comfortable. It's very, very painful. And you could have pain for years after, if not for, for a lifetime. So it's recommended that everyone who is 60 and above with the old vaccine called Zostravax, 60 and above to get the shingle vaccine. It's a one-time shot. More recently, there's a new vaccine that came out around a year, at best two years ago, called the Shinrix, that is actually more, more effective starting at age 50. So if, you have, if you're 50 and above, you should get the Shingo vaccine. Now, if you're under five, they also have a similar one, but they have the chicken pox vaccine. So that, those are for under five. But we're mostly focusing on adults, so we're talking about the Shingo, uh, the disaster vaccine. Okay, it's very effective for 65, 75, but you can give as young as 50 for Shinrix and 60 for Zostravax. Okay, another one that's often forget by many providers, so please talk to your doctor, is what's called tetanus. Just the T, it's called TD, that's a tetanus. Tetanus should be given every 10 years. So what is tetanus? It's from a bacterial infection called tetany, which pretty much will have your muscles spasm up. From, from, from anything that's metal, you know, you cut your hand, you step on rusty nails, you can get the tetanus. So that's why you should get the tetanus vaccine it's every 10 years. It's recommended that if you haven't gotten one, you should also get the D, which is the diphtheria, and pertussis, which is the P, the pertussis. We found that the immunity for pertussis, which is the whooping cough, has waned down. So therefore, everyone, if they haven't gotten a one-time booster, they should get a Tdap, a one-time booster, 
as their, first, as their replacement for tetanus. Let's say you got a tetanus two years ago and you have not gotten a booster for Tdap, then you need another Tdap. Once you get a Tdap, then you can replace every 10 years with, with just the normal tetanus. So therefore, every adult, male, female, regardless of your condition, should get a Tdap. And actually, they're giving this to all, pregnant, pre all women who are pregnant, regardless of their history. They say, oh, I got one of it. It doesn't matter. To protect the baby, you're getting a Tdap. So that's, that's recommended. So, if, if, so, so DTAP is given to children. Tdap is given to adults. So the TD is just said this every 10 years. But then the U.S. recommends a booster as well as the CDC recommends a booster of the, of the Tdap, the Tdap, at least once. So for all adults 19 or older. HPV. So HPV, unfortunately, only given to, ki to kids between 9 and 26. But most often we start at, at 11. HPV, as I mentioned before, is the cervical cancer causing as well in female, but also in male, penile cancer as well, it was not listed, genital warts. There it's genital warts, and then oropharyngeal, which is a mouth, mouth cancer. So HPV, once we've found this vaccine, that those cancer has dropped, and we still have a few years to go to see where it's going because it's a rel relatively new vaccine, but it should be given to all female and male. So given, even though we started between 11 and 12, it is approved for as early as nine. And it goes up to 26. So many times if you have young kids or be under 26 or have it, come in to see the doctor and get the HPV. Okay, there are different brands out there and some are, and now it used to be three shots, now it's actually only two if they're under 15. So that's the HPV. A couple of other uh, screening, which is one of them is the osteoporosis, which is weak bone. So how do you test for that? Pretty much you have, you have to get a bone scan. It's for, recommended for women 65 years and older. Because once a woman hit menopause, their bone becomes very fragile because estrogen is one of the biggest protectors for bone. So a 65, woman 65 years and older should get a bone scan to see if they have osteoporosis. Now, there's, uh, if you have other conditions such as these, then you may want to get screened sooner for, with the DEXA scan. But shy of these conditions, then 65 years of, and older for, for a woman. Now, men, there's no recommendation for men to get it, but many organizations says that men above 70 should get a bone scan as well. So that's osteoporosis, okay? So let's talk about infection. What should we be looking for? First, hepatitis B. If you, not just you are a drug user, but if you're in a household, if you have family member who are, who are positive for HIV, drug user, or men having sex with men, and if you're close to them, you should be screened for hepatitis B. Hepatitis C, if you're born between these two years, regardless of your health condition, you should be checked for hepatitis C. And your, your doctor can check that simply with a blood test. Okay? And in addition to checking hepatitis B, you should also check the infection, check to see if they have the titer. Because if not, then you can be vaccinated because we have a vaccination for hepatitis B, but not for hepatitis C. We have great drugs to treat both B and C nowadays, so therefore it should be screened. If you're born between these years, a hepatitis C blood test should be done. HIV, so it's, this is something else that many providers forget to check. Many organizations, the CDC, WHO, U.S. Preventive Task Force, recommend annual HIV tests between 15 and 65. So for my patient, I always tell them because they're not used to it, that we actually said, you know, I'm ordering this test because people think, why are you checking, checking an HIV test? I don't have sex. But it's recommended because of blood transfusion or many things, and it's very treatable. So everybody, regardless of your health condition, between 15 and 65, should have an HIV test done. Okay? Now, in California, in the past, you had to have permission in order to do an HIV test. You had to sign a consent to get an HIV test. Now, California law, as well as many around the country, with a new recommendation, reverse the law saying that if you don't want HIV, you have to sign a consent saying that you are opting out because it's, it's that important to try to curtail the spread of HIV infection. So once again, everybody between 15 and 65 should have an HIV test done. Gonorrhea chlamydia is generally for under 26, mostly female. They should be screened for gonorrhea chlamydia, of course, if they're sexually active. 
But many times, many of my adolescent and young women, they are not willing to say if they're sexually active or they, they don't know what the definition of sexually active is. So the recommendation is they should be screened for chlamydia and gonorrhea, okay? Because it's very treatable. And that's where the population that has the most amount, just like hepatitis C, only under 26 and younger uh, if they're sexually active, okay? Okay, there are other, a lot of other stuff that we should screen for that we don't have time to talk about, so I just want to talk about the other stuff. Diabetes, thyroid disease, cholesterol, smoking, blood pressure, depression. Triple A is the aneurysm. It's called abdominal aortic aneurysm. And this is only mostly in men who smoked. If you touch a cigarette, you should get a triple A because it, it, it can burst at any time. And there's a lot more. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to cover all. I just covered the most important one, which is, which is a cancer, and a couple of the other important stuff. Okay? Other than that, okay. Well, thank you for coming. That's it.